Let's discuss some of the applications of uh, electromagnetic induction, some of the most important ones. There is many. Pretty much any device that you can think of that uh, receives signals, electromagnetic signals, or you know, sends them, it's using, is working uh, through uh, these principles that we have talked about. There is induction going at some point, either in the antenna of your cell phone or in the, you know, the antenna for sending signals and for receiving them inside in the circuitry. Uh, induction happens in pretty much any uh, electronic device that you can think of. But uh, some of the more common applications are generators, which are used to generate electricity in a power plant. And the idea with a generator is that you, it's simply an electric motor. An electric motor would have a shaft, right? You will have a coil inside uh, connected to the shaft. There will be either permanent magnets that have been attached to it, or you could generate the magnetic field with a current, with an electromagnet like this, right? So in an electric motor, what you have is you have a source of power, of electricity, which you connect to the motor. That uh, current flows through the coil. It interacts with the magnetic field of the magnet and it makes this thing turn, right? So you input electric energy or electricity, and your output is mechanical work. You can use the motor to you know, turn something, raise something, whatever you want to do with that. With a, that's an electric motor. But with a generator, what you do is exactly the opposite of this. So what you do is Mechanically, you turn the shaft, either with your hand or you connect this to a wheel that is uh, spun by uh, vapor flowing through a, through a pipe or by water flowing, you know, sliding down a canal uh, uh, in a dam. Whatever means you have to turn that crank, that would spin the coil in the magnetic field, right? The result of that is going to be a difference in potential between the two sides of the motor. Because when you spin that coil inside that magnetic field, so that there is a magnetic field going this way, the flux through the coil is changing. The flux through that coil is equal to B dot product with A. So if you change the orientation of the area, the flux going through that coil changes. It's maximum when the coil is perpendicular to the magnetic field lines. It's minimum when the coil is facing uh, 90 degrees. So by turning this crank, you change the orientation of the coil inside the, this motor, which now is operating as a generator. And because of that, there is an induced EMF, according to Faraday's law, the EMF induced will show up here, which is equal to the phi dt. So you can connect a, a light bulb there, and that would produce, uh, that the current will go through the light bulb, will produce light, or you can connect another electric motor and Cranking one motor would make the other motor move. You know, whatever you want to do with this difference in potential, you know, you can do it. So in that way, operating an electric motor in reverse, you input mechanical work and you get out electric power, which is exactly the opposite of how the electric motor works. You put in electric power and you get out a mechanical work. Another important one are transformers. Those are the things that you hear to uh, explode when there is a storm. The idea with a transformer is always the same, which is you have an iron core, so this is all iron, and on that iron core, you put, you wrap around some wire, you make, say, N1 turns on that side, you connect this to some source of voltage, it should be a source of voltage that changes with time, so an AC power source, right? That would be what you get out of an outlet in your house or in a building. So you connect that that way. So because the current is AC, so it's going up and down, up and down, positive and negative, the voltage, that has a current flowing in the primary, as this part is called, the primary circuit. You have a current that is changing with time. A magnetic field, therefore, is induced inside the core that changes with time. That magnetic field kind of flows around the core, that's the magnetic field, of the uh, transformer. And then on the right-hand side, you have another coil, 
you wrap around some more wire, and this is going to be the output. You might connect a light bulb here, whatever you connect here, let's say that it's a light bulb. This is your secondary circuit right here. That's a separate circuit from the primary. This is the secondary. And this one has a number of, a number of turns, say N2, on that side of the transformer. So what happens? Well, the induce, the magnetic field that is changing, that is flowing through the core, is changing with time. And that is producing a flux in the secondary. And that flux is changing with time. So every time there is a change in flux, you have an induced current. So a current is induced in the secondary. Okay. Now there is a connection between the voltages that you get on one side and on the other. The voltage of the primary is related to the voltage of the secondary. Let me write it the other way. The voltage of the secondary. So the voltage that you get, the difference in potential that you get here, let's call that V2, and the difference in potential that you have here, let's call that V1, right? V2 is connected to V1 through this equation. I don't have time to go through the details of that. But the idea is that the more turns that you have on N2, if N2 is bigger than N1, then V2 is going to be bigger than V1. So the transformer is basically changing the voltage of the line. If you have, uh, say, 10 volts on the left, AC, by making a coil, the secondary being 10 times the number of turns as in the primary, you can get a voltage that is 10 times. V2 can be 10 times V1. So if you want to increase the voltage, you want to set up a transformer with N2 bigger than N1. But you can also use it to decrease the voltage. So if you want to have a transformer that uh, uh, gets the 120 volts from the outlet and turns it into, say, 12 volts for your laptop, what you want to do is use a transformer right, that has N1 bigger than N2. If that is the case, then V1 is going to be bigger than V2, which is what you want. You want to go from 120 to something less. Right? So transformers would typically be used, uh, for example, from the power station to increase the voltage to the tower, to the lines that carry uh, the current from one city to another. For long distances, you want high voltages. So you want to step up transformer from the power uh, uh, plant to the lines. But once, once those lines get near a city, you need to start bringing down the voltage because you're not going to have a million volts coming out of your outlet. That would be not very practical or safe. So from those power lines, they, they go to substations where these transformers or set of transformers step down the voltage of those lines from 100,000 volts to 1,000 and then the next step from 1,000 to a couple hundred and so on until you get to these transformers in the neighborhoods that bring down the voltage to 120, which is what you use in households. So that's, that's the, another application of induction. There's many other ones, as I said. But let me uh, quickly mention something here, which is, um, as a physicist, you wonder about what is making the charges in these loops spin around. Right? Imagine the, remember the case where you have a coil and you bring the magnet close to the coil. As you bring the magnet close to the coil, we know that there is an induced current. What is making that current flow? And remember that in physics, we can think about everything in terms of forces. So far, we have only described things. We have described what happens when you move the magnet. We say there is an induced current, and the direction of the current is given by Lenz's law. And I know how much current will flow if I use Faraday's law. But we haven't said why is there a current really, right? And there should be the explanation should be in terms of a force acting on the charges inside the wire. That would be the only acceptable explanation from a physics point of view, right? So what is that force that is making those charges uh, move? So think of the coil and your magnet moving here. And the magnet is getting closer to the coil. And we say that there will be a current flowing there in that direction. But something must be responsible for accelerating the charges inside the coil, inside the wire. What is responsible for that? Is it a magnetic force? It's not a magnetic force because a charge, if you look at inside, let's say that this is the wire. If you look inside the wire, say a positive charge here, right? That charge to experience a magnetic force should be moving. 
If there's no motion of that charge, there's no magnetic force on that charge. But the charge is not moving because the coil is not moving. It's the magnet that is doing the motion, not the coil. So it's not a magnetic force that explains why that charge starts to spin around like that. So it's got to be an electric force. That's right, because electric forces make charges move, right? So there must be some electric field that is responsible for making these charges spin around like that. And that is indeed the case. Let me show you a little picture that I did. I, I don't want to try to draw that again because it's kind of hard. Here's my picture of the magnet. As it's moving, the green vector represents the velocity. So the magnet is going in some direction. For an observer that sees this magnet moving, the magnetic field lines are, you know, the magnetic field lines of a magnet. Those you know very well. But the, uh, there is, in the space surrounding the magnet, there is this electric field that is generated because the magnetic field lines are changing in time. So you can see that those electric field lines spin around the magnet. They are there regardless of whether you put a coil next to the magnet or not. They are there. As soon as you move a magnet, and it is moving with respect to you, there will be electric field lines surrounding the magnetic field lines. The magnetic field, li the magnetic field and the electric field show up always one with the other, OK? So the equation that actually tells you that is, just going to write it here. It's not really that important that you remember it. But it's an equation that looks like this. You might be familiar with this, or maybe not, with these symbols. What that equation says, basically, is the, the electric field curls around magnetic field lines when they're changing. So if you have a magnetic field line like this, and that magnetic field line is changing in time, there will be an electric field that curls around that magnetic field line. Okay? There is a physics law that, that uh, tells you that, that that is one of the equations of Maxwell's equations. This is one of the four equations in uh, Maxwell's equation. Okay? So that is what's driving that current. Now this is starting to... Uh, point in the direction of relati relativity, because for an observer for which the magnet does not move, there will not be any electric field lines. If I have a magnet look, uh, and I'm holding it with my hand, that magnet only has a magnetic field lines around it, no electric field lines. To be able to measure electric field lines coming out of that magnet, that magnet would have to be moving with respect to me. So now that, that is very uh, weird, because two observers one person walking in this room and me stationary, if I'm holding the magnet, for me, the magnet only has magnetic field lines. But for the person walking in the room, measuring the uh, field lines of this magnet, that person would measure magnetic and electric field lines. So we disagree on what fields are present in the room. Two observers, just because they're moving with different speed, will disagree on what uh, fields are, are there. So uh, this is uh, the beginning of the connection between magnetism and relativity.